Jesus for what he's done for me. I'm just trying to follow along. It's three verses. We'll do the first, second, and last. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, chorus again. Oh, how I love Jesus. That's a key change. Oh, I can't find it. Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. On that fourth verse, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear me low. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I Those are wonderful words that Jesus loves us so. Beautiful words. 
words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Interlude. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctified forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Number 508, because of those beautiful words of life which are as love for us, it is love that lifted me. sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master heard the sea, heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by His love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows His will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. And because of that love, we give God all the glory, number 56. God. 
God be the glory, great things he had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he had done. Great things he has taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, who purer and higher and greater will be. Our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. For our special music today, turn to number 780 and just help me sing the first and last verse of this wonderful song until then. A wonderful song that makes you think, what are you going to do till Jesus returns or calls us home? sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward this troubled world is not my final but until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me. This weary world with all its toll and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife. 
The soul of man is like a waiting falcon when it's released, is destined for the skies. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me alone. Can your heart sing? Midst everything that's happening till the day he calls you home. Psalms 38 this morning, 1 through 12. Psalms 38. In the 19th of April, 2005, the Catholic Church elected a new pope. The pope's real name was Joseph Aloysius Ratzinger. Everyone knows him, though, as Pope Benedict XVI. This pope now has resigned, and Pope Francis is in his place. And you probably recognize those two names, but there's probably a name that you don't recognize. His name was Rogers Cadenhead. He was a very smart guy. He was a computer guy. And six months before Pope Benedict was installed and voted on, he purchased and registered a website that was www.benedict16th.com. Now you guessed it, that was the next pope that was called. And since he registered this website, the Vatican couldn't use it. And the Vatican wanted this website, so they offered him $20,000 for that website. He wrote a letter to the Pope at that time, and he said, I'll give you this website and this domain, but I need some things besides the money. He said, I want a hat like the Pope wears. He said, I want a free stay at the Vatican Hotel. And he said, I want complete absolution, no questions asked, for the third week of March, 1987. And it was signed, Rogers Caterham. Makes you wonder, what did he do on the third week of March, 1997? Now, let me explain something to you about the Catholic religion. If you receive absolution from the Pope on anything, it's as if, if that event never occurred. It's wiped out of history. You're no longer guilty. You no longer have to feel ashamed. It can be removed from aspect of your memory. It'll be as it have never happened. Now, I'm just talking theology of the Catholic Church. That's what they believe. You know that's not true. <laughs> There's only one that can absolve your sins, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you think about it, this is true for most of us that we have a March, third week of March, 1987. Some little thing that we've done or, or something that we do or something we're ashamed about and we wished it never happened. Maybe it was a few uncalled words to somebody that broke a relationship. Maybe it was a certain act that you had hidden from everybody. And you don't want your secret revealed. Maybe it was an unethical decision. We could go on and on in the list. Maybe it was alcohol, deception, hate, lies, abusiveness. If there was a set of diaries on your life, do you have one that you think, you know, you'd rip that page out? If you could? If you're here on Wednesday night, you'll learn that there is a diary on your life. We started talking about that Wednesday night. Maybe you want a whole week gone out of your life. We don't want to feel guilty about things. 
We don't want to be in a place that if somebody was to find something out about our life, we'd be ashamed. So we want to remove events in our life from our memory. We want to go on as if it never happened. And that brings us to our psalm today. Psalm 38 is a psalm from a person who feels this way, weighted down by a sin in his life. And as we go through this, maybe you can recognize the feelings that he's having. But these are feelings our Lord understands. Psalms 38. A psalm of David to bring to remembrance. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden that are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a lonesome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before Thee, and my groaning is not hid from Thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and from my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceit all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear me, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually befallen before me. For I will declare my iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin, but my enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I will follow the thing that is good. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me, make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, allow us to glean from these what we need to this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you read these verses, it doesn't sound like David has much hope, does he? David is in a pit of despair. Everything is going bad. Everything is going against him. But what David now recognizes is that's because of his sin. And because of the sin that was in his life, this guilt in his life was overwhelming him, and it became a burden that was too heavy to bear. That's what sin does, doesn't it? When we do something and, and we regret it, that guilt just seems to weigh on us, and it just seems to burden our whole life. Physically, we know that there's a limit to the amount of weight any person can carry. There's, there's just so much you can pick up and carry. Some more than others. But at some point, even the strongest person can't carry it anymore. I don't know if you've ever seen these strongman contests on TV where they sit there and they're, they're carrying big heavy weights and then they drop it and pick up another one, they drop it and pick up another one. And some of these guys, 
just get to the point they can't do it anymore. And they have to shed that weight. Well, it's the same way with the weight of sin. The weight of sin pulls us down. It makes us feel unworthy. It holds us back. And this weight comes to a point where it's too much to bear. And that's where David was. I am bowed down. I am brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with severe pain. There is no health in my body. I'm feeble. I'm utterly crushed. I groan in anguish, David was saying. This is the growing strength of guilt on his life. We feel this in times of unspiritual decisions we make in our life. We think they don't matter in the long term, but they do. And as we keep on making decisions, as we keep on cutting corners, as we keep on compromising standards, as we keep on hiding moral failures, as we keep on doing this and stay true to who we are, as believers in Christ, it will haunt us. Not all the time. And not all the time in pain. But these effects can have effects on our life where sin can cause us physical anguish because of the guilt that we carry. Paul says, I am like the deaf who cannot hear, like the mute who cannot speak. I have become like those who do not hear, whose mouth cannot offer a reply. When, when we were children, our parents might say to us, stay home, I've got to go out for a minute. So the moment they leave, we take off and do what we want to do. And we try to make it back before they get home. And we do. We don't know how, but it always seemed that somehow our parents knew just what we did. And how we got caught, we have no idea. You know, it makes you wonder why I even tried to do anything wrong in the first place. Because they would know. And you know, the first thing they'd ask you when you get home, did you go anywhere? No, we didn't. What do you say? There's nothing else to say. You already know they know. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask that question. But that's the way it is with God, isn't it? We try to think of a reason. We try to rationalize why we do things. Why do we say something when it hurt others? Why do we know we are at the cause of a breakdown because of something in our life? What do we say when we've hurt God? What can you say that's going to fix it when it seems like nothing's going to fix it? That's how it works, doesn't it? We need to no longer feel guilty. We do not want to feel shame. We don't want to longer, no longer be in a place where it's affecting our memory. We don't want to go on where if this as we want to go on as this has never happened. And that's just like David. Sometimes we feel we can't. David's saying, God, are you listening? God, are you there? Don't forsake me, Lord. You see what this sin does to me. This is what these events do. These sins hold on to us, whether they're in the recent past or maybe they're long ago. They affect relationships, especially with God. I guarantee you that's why a lot of churches are empty nowadays. We become so sure, and some of us so sure, that we're too bad for God. Not even He can do anything for us. Why would God accept me like this when I act this way? When this is part of my history? Why would God want me? What could He do with me? How can I dare to come in His presence with the things I've done? It affected my relationship with Him and others. I've hurt too many people. I've hidden too many things. If they knew the real me, they wouldn't accept me. And this hurts our relationship with ourselves. Because then we feel we're unworthy. We feel we're hopeless, helpless, ashamed. And we feel we're trapped. But the question is, are we really trapped? Does the rest of our life have to be defined by the action of what 
we have done in our past or even in our presence? Do we need to keep holding on to it? Do we need to keep reliving the consequences of it? Do we need to keep on living in fear because of the effects of sin? These are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. And the answer to all these questions is no. We are never to be defined by our past. We need to understand this so clearly that we are not defined by our past. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen says this, Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. All may fit into somewhere sometimes we don't think we fit in. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And for such were some of you, but ye are now washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If you are a child of God, you are no longer defined by your past. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. You are not defined by your past you, and you are not defined by your presence. You should be defined by the grace of God. Saying, Jesus, here I am. I need your grace, I need your love, but more than that, I need your forgiveness. But our past seems to define us and we keep reliving the consequences of that and we keep weighing it down on our lives. But as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the Lord's love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is as the west, as far as He removed our transgressions from us. If you are a child of God, you are completely different. There's been a complete change in who you are. You don't need to keep reliving the consequences of your past. You can move on as if it never happened. That's a transformation that takes place. Think about butterflies. When you see a butterfly, do you go, Oh, look, that's a caterpillar with wings. No, you go, oh, look, that's a butterfly. You knew it was a caterpillar at one time, but it changed. And it's the same way when you are a child of God. We never call butterflies caterpillar with wings because they're completely different to what they were before. And that's what Jesus offers us. That's what we've been offered. It's been removed so far from us that there's been a transformation that makes us completely different. The word that we use that describes this transformation is the word justification. Justification is this, my conscience accuses me. I've sinned against in all of God's commandments. I'm still inclined toward evil, but without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits me the righteousness and holiness of Christ as if I have never sinned nor am a sinner. That's what justification is. Just as if you have never sinned. As if it had been as obedient as Christ. In Christ, Christ's obedience is now your obedience. That's why forgiveness is so powerful. That's why we don't have to live the consequences. And also, that's why we don't have to live in fear or the effects of sin on our lives. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. In this way, love is among us so that we have the confidence of the day of judgment because in this world we are like Him. See that? Not not in the future, not in heaven. It says, in this world, we are like Him when we fully surrender to Him. And there's no fear anymore of the things of our past or once we turn our life over to Him in our presence because love drives out the fear of punishment from us. We don't have to be afraid of the effects of sin on our life because it's been dealt with. 
a dad and his son were driving down the road. The son had a bee allergy, and as they were driving, a bee flew in the window. His dad reached out, grabbed the bee, and held onto it, and after a little while, he let the bee go. The child was afraid. Why'd you let the bee go? The dad showed the child his hand and said, here's the stinger. The bee's not effective for you anymore. Scripture tells us that Jesus takes the sting of death, the sting of guilt and of shame, the sting of the consequences, the sting of hurt, the sting of everything that comes with standing under sin in our lives. And because of Jesus, sin can no longer affect us. It's gone. And that makes a whole lot of difference, doesn't it? So, through Christ, like Roger's canon had thought he had gotten, we have all those wonderful things of absolution of sin. Everyone's got the things they've done. Everyone has a decision that we made that we don't like we made. Everyone has words that we've said that we don't like we said, that we didn't like saying. Everyone has actions that we've done that we're not happy we did them. Everyone has lifestyles that we've been in that we're not happy we've been in them. Everyone has that thing in their life. And everyone wants to know that they're no longer under the guilt of that thing that was in their life. They want to know that it never was, it never will, it never has happened. I don't want to be guilty. I don't want to feel ashamed. I don't want to have continually reliving this event in my memory. I just want to go on as if it never happened. <clears throat> well, it can be like that. You don't have to write to Pope to do that. All you need to do is get on your knees to the Lord Jesus Christ. All you need to do is look at Jesus, look at the nail-scarred hands, and recognize He is doing this because He wants your life to be just as if you never sinned. He wants it to be so that you wake up every day to a new day. Every week to a new week. Every month to a new month. Every year to a new year. Every decade to a new decade. And know that all things are new. And know the truth that the promise of forgiveness is a promise which He says you don't have to feel guilty anymore. You don't have to feel ashamed. The memory can be removed. You can go on from this moment as if it never happened. The grace of Jesus Christ is new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. But David, through all this, had to learn the one thing we all need to learn. And it starts with the fact that we have to forgive ourselves. Until we forgive ourselves of the sin that we committed, we'll never understand the forgiveness of Christ. You know, people are living in this world in sin more prevalent now than ever before. And you don't see guilt and you don't see any remorse or anything because they don't believe they've sinned against a powerful God. But once you realize that you've sinned against God, you get to the point where David, in David's life here, he committed great sin. And you know what was happening in his life. If you know the story of David with Bathsheba and her husband. Great sin David committed. It was weighing him down. But David had to learn first and foremost that he had to forgive himself for doing that and then seek the Lord's forgiveness. And today, are you ready to cry out like David in verse 22? Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. David got to the point where his life, where the guilt of everything that was in his life was weighing him down so much, it literally made him sick. But he knew the only way out was to seek the Lord, and the Lord will offer forgiveness and salvation. This is a tough psalm. 
it, it's a tough psalm to understand, but I think we all have that part in our life where we hope nobody ever finds out about or hope nobody ever knows about. But guess what? Nobody ever will if you've forgiven yourself for it and turned it over to Christ. Because Christ has forgave you and Christ said, don't worry about it, it's gone. As far as is the east is from the west. And it will never be held against you anymore. And what a joyful day that will be when that happens. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I thank you for the cry of David. And Lord, there's so many times in our life where we need to learn to cry out to you and seek your face. Lord, we need to understand that once we're in tune with you, that the things of the past and maybe the things of the present are gone completely. And you've wiped them clean. Because through you we have a clean slate to start all over. And Lord, that's why we need your Spirit. That's why you sent your Spirit. Because you knew the battle we would go through once this happens. And Lord, we thank you for that strength that you give us through that. And Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that you give us. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Number 482. Jesus is tenderly calling. service due to the illnesses that are going around and, and continue to pray for them and we just thank you for this time together let's be dismissed dear lord and heavenly father we just thank you for this time that we've had the songs the the preaching the time together to study your word lord we can't praise you enough for everything you do in our lives but lord if there's someone here this morning that's holding on to something lord allow them to surrender to you fully and feel the forgiveness first of all in their heart and then feel the forgiveness that only you can offer and be starting anew knowing that can never be held against us again what a joy that will be when even though we live in this world and the things of it the day we stand before him in heaven he'll say not guilty and what a joy that will be be with us as we take what we've learned today out into this world. Bring us back again to study your word on Wednesday night and back again next Sunday to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.